Welcome everyone, this is Final Resonance TV. We're here with the Musical Journeys episode Magic 16. I'm your host Lisa Williams and today we have behind the camera Jeff Gobble himself, the man who usually is the host, but today... I got talked into it. Yes, right. We're going to ask him the questions and we're going to find out more about Jeff. Uh -oh. uh, I've known Jeff for a while, amazing musician, recording artist, friend, businessman, uh, all those things, but I think it's going to really be cool to find out from him today. And I've got some questions I for haven't you. even looked or anything. This is totally off the That's cuff. That's right. Totally off the cuff. So to start out, okay. all right, to get us really in serious mode to get going here, right. I'm going to ask you these questions and you're going to answer off the top of your head, okay? Okay. All right. Coated strings or non-coated strings? Non-coated strings. All right. Now you know. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. All right. <laughs> now you know how to bribe them. All right. Les Paul or Fender? Les Paul. Okay. Humbucker man. Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Uh, okay, I've seen like five Coke cans around here, so I know what <laughs> you're saying. And I cleaned up, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Key of A or Key of D? A. A. Of course. All right. Guitar players. That's right, exactly. Ice cream or donuts? Both. <laughs> Both. Why should you have to choose? Right. All right. All right. Pick or no pick? Pick. Pick. Okay. Most of the time. Can you guess this one? Hat or no hat? Hat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. M&M's or Reese's Cups? Uh, Reese's Cups more often. Okay. You have a favorite color of M&M's? Mm, Green? Not really. Red? I'm not, yeah. not really. I okay. even eat the brown ones. Okay. <laughs> All right. Digital or analog? Both. Both. Kind of like donuts and ice cream. All right. Yeah. Last one. EL84 or 6L6? Ooh, that's tough. EL84 or 6L6? Mm -hmm. Both. Both. <laughs> all right. This is the man that wants it all. I want them both. <laughs> I have them both. I like them both. All right. Both are good. All right. So tell us about how you got started in music. What inspired you? We all have our inspiration stories. What is What, what got you saying, hey, you know what? I got to pick up the guitar and I got to play music. Well, I mean, you know, there's the obvious one that most people know, but I'm going to go back a little further. Okay. My mother was really excited about the idea of me playing an instrument, so she wanted me to take up piano. Uh, when we were kids, there was all kinds of stuff playing in the in the house, everything from ABBA and uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash and wow. Simon and Garfunkel and Barry Manilow and a whole bunch of different things. So it was all over the place, um, but I didn't connect with the piano that quickly. And I, don't, I never really took a lesson. My mother and sister both played. Um, so I never connected for the piano. As, as, I, just, I don't thought it was too hard or something. I don't know. It just didn't grab me. So in uh, 83, I saw Eddie Van Halen on TV. Okay, and how old were you? I was about 15, 15. 14 or 15. Okay. Um, and I saw him on TV, and I saw him in a video called by them by Van Halen called Unchained, which was a live video, on a show called Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. I remember that. Which was like Great stuff. midnight special era show, late night show that just came on. It just came on randomly, and I just saw David Lee Roth, and I was like, whoa, who's this guy? The next thing I knew, I heard Eddie Van Halen. Mm -hmm. But I'd already heard him. I didn't know it. It was a Beat It that I heard him on before that, but I didn't. At the time, you didn't see people's faces readily. They didn't have their faces. If they were a guest musician on, yeah. say, Thriller, you didn't see his face. You, it was in a liner note. Mm -hmm. um, so I had actually heard him, but I didn't connect with him yet. So when I did, it was monumental. So right. yeah, I was. Uh, and so, what did your mom say when you said, "Mom, I want to play the guitar, no more piano stuff"? Well, they were, you know, they wanted me to. Yeah, they wanted me to play something, so okay, they were all right. about it. So okay. they, they uh, took me to a store in Birmingham called Forbes Music, which is no longer there, uh, down on 4th Avenue, I think, downtown. And we started looking at guitars, and one of the first guitars I was attracted to was obviously something like Eddie Van Halen, a single humbucker in the back, mm -hmm. a real stripped down. There was a, a Roadstar Ibanez that was like that. And then there was a Les Paul, a black Les Paul custom that was used that they had, which was amazingly only five hundred dollars. Oh my gosh, that was a lot of money. At, yeah, the, at the time it was, <laughs> but now, yeah. And I was kind of like, I really wanted that. And then they had another amp that I really liked, which was a, a Super Champ by Fender, 
which is really the first small tube amp that sounded like what we know as modern mm -hmm. distortion, and you know, today. And so I had this Les Paul plugged into the Super Champ, and I was just probably hitting one string or something. But I knew that that was the sound <laughs> that, that was I wanted. It, that was it. But anyway, the, you know, the parents, of course, were probably like, let's, let's get him something, but, you know, let's get him started, and then we'll see where he goes. So I ended up with a Roadstar. That's a two-pickup humbucker guitar. Mm -hmm. And a, I think it was either a Crate or an Ibanez amp that had distortion on it, pulled, yeah, like pulled it, uh, the pot to do it. And so I sat around trying to play for the next year, you know. Yeah. And, and what uh, was your first song that you learned? Well, all the way through was uh, Paranoid by Black Sabbath. Wow. I'm trying to think if there was anything else that I could think of riffs. But at first it was just trying to get around, mm -hmm. you know. And I think Paranoid was the first song that I actually could play all the way through. Okay, so this was in high school, and did you put a band together? After, yeah, after yeah, I mean, almost playing? immediately after I got my guitar, I... Uh, oh, that's ambitious. That's well, good. I had friends in high school, yeah. and we were all, we were doing BMX and stuff, so, you know, immediately, mm -hmm. I got to get my friends involved in this. So I get my friends involved, and one of them gets a bass, and uh, I get my other buddy to play a second guitar, and we put together a little band, and uh, in fact, that bass right there was the bass. My, my buddy's bass. Still have it. That's yeah, great. Still have his bass. And we have this, the matching guitar. So we would we would uh, go to the same teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we started taking from a teacher named Kenny Bush who um, would take us back to back. My mom would drive us over there and he would go in for his 30 minutes and then I would come out or he would come out and I would go in for 30 minutes. But we would learn the same songs. Okay. He would learn the bass to whatever Iron Maiden or whatever and I would learn the guitar to that so we could play together and that's kind of how we started okay. to build a band. We had a drummer and and we had a high school band called Midnight Sun which kind of changed members as we went but um well tell me this then. how did it feel what was it like being the first performance because I think everyone oh God. remembers yeah. Yeah. the first performance they've had <laughs> what did what did it feel like um how was it on stage and then when you walked off the stage what was the feeling okay well this actually the first performance I ever had was for my sister's friends. They had a house party at my house, mm -hmm. my sister's friends. So somehow we snaked our way into being able to do, to be the band for this thing. In fact, I just posted a picture on Instagram <laughs> this week about that, that picture of me and my drummer and a guitar player. We were playing dual guitars with just drums at the time. And, uh, we played Iron Maiden and all the stuff we liked, right? But my sister's friends, they were like really, they were really nice about it for for a little bit. But then they all went back on the back deck <laughs> and got away from us while we, the the, right, while we played the played the Maiden. So that was my first experience with you know pleasing your crowd. Okay. And uh, but it was the first time I played live, so I was a little scared, you know, even though it was only twenty five or thirty people. Yeah. And uh, but I think I can't remember exactly how it came about, but maybe my mom suggested that they do that or something just to give us the opportunity to experience that. Well, that's probably where, you know, you have always been very smart in the way you have put your bands together. You're, you treat music as a creative outlet, entertainment, but you also treat it as a business. Right. And I think that's why, you know, you are seen as one of the successful musicians in this town because you do treat it like a business. Um, but you understand your audience. Yeah. So tell me the process of how you go about putting a band together because you have had many bands and you right. currently have right. more than one band. Right. Um, that's a lot of juggling around. Yeah. Um, so how do you go about putting the right people in the band and and the and the business of the band? Well, you know, early on it was just my friends. Yeah, you know, we we were just. But that's when we first I first learned about you know chemistry within bands. Mm -hmm. You know who. Who fits and what, who, you know, complements each other and, you know, can we be consistent and put together something that's really good. And yeah. so you learn about dealing with people, personalities, and you try to find the right people that fit together. And it's, it's difficult. I mean, even like over the last 10 years, I've been able to find good people, you know, mm -hmm. really good people. Everybody's been great, a great singer, a great player. Um, but sometimes people's lives take, you know, different Pass. So when they take their different paths, it, it's just something you have to roll with the changes. Mm -hmm. it's, it was hard for me for a long time to roll with those changes because you you invest so much in yeah. 
That's each true. project, each time. You know, I don't think people realize how much time it takes you to put together a band and put together a list of songs mm -hmm. and be everybody be on the same page and then get really good at it, only to be just getting good at it when somebody's got to move or yeah. decides. And then getting all the gigs together, too. That's a lot of yeah, work right there. Yeah, you're working on all that at the same time. So all that happens, and it's really hard to be consistent. And I think the for bands, you know, it, it, if you can stay together long enough, mm -hmm. it really pays dividends, you know. You've got to stay together long enough to, to see the, the fruits of your labors because it takes a while. So, you know, I've been lucky, especially with, uh, like, Crush was a 10-year band. And that is, that's pretty amazing to have a band for 10 yeah, years. It's, it was hard. It was hard. There was a lot of changes, too. We had a lot of different members. But through it all, we kind of kept the same uh, type of music that we did, mm -hmm. the, the general uh, type of dance rock that we did. And that really worked for us. So, um, but before that, if you go back before I was even here in Huntsville, I was playing with older guys who kind of taught me the ropes about playing to crowds, playing to certain situations. And I learned after playing weekend after weekend of house gigs that I had in Birmingham, I did it for 10 years, mm -hmm. where I played music that I wasn't familiar with, uh, not the stuff that I grew up on, um, but classic songs. And those songs helped me build a repertoire on top of what I already had, which was the rock stuff. Yeah, you know, okay. the My yeah. Girls and all those things, yeah. those classic songs. Uh, they helped me learn those songs. And that was something that I came to town with and used in Crush initially was to create as much variety as possible so that I could get something out there for everybody that would come see us every night. And that was my first thing. Okay. But then you have to think about the singer. How how capable is Can the singer sing to do yeah. all of that? It's very difficult to have somebody who has all that range from the bottom to the top to be able to cover all that different types of material. So, again, it's finding the right people mm -hmm. that can do those things. I mean, I, sometimes I think people might think that I'm really hard on singers because I expect <laughs> them to do Journey one minute and then, you know, I don't know, uh, who knows, easy or something the next minute, you know, and it's a huge range of, but I've been lucky. I found some people that could do those things. Yeah. So it's great when you can find them and they're the right kind of, they have the right kind of work ethic. Mm -hmm. They have the other pieces to go with it. Yeah. So that's important. It's that really is. important. And that's, that, that's a tough thing to put, you know, three to five people together oh, yeah. because it, it is a family that right. is trying to get along all the time together. Right, right. And, and then you got to have not only the, the given skills to play and mm -hmm. sing, but you got to be able to be on time. You got to be able to treat it like a business because That's you're true. being paid to be at your work. That's right. <laughs> and I know it's hard for people to put the artistic side around the money, and I don't like to either. I mean, I'm like everybody else in here. I have a artistic leaning, mm -hmm. but. I've learned that if I want to do this for a living, I have to be able to be flexible. Yes, that's true. And, and it, it, is a, it is a business. And yeah. that's um, one of the things, before I really had the opportunity to meet you in person, I, that's the one thing that I observed about you from the outside. Oh, okay. Was I, I definitely noticed, you're a very talented musician. Thanks. But I noticed the way you operated that you're also a really good businessman. And, that, and that's the only way you can do it if you're going to make it. You know, yeah, I, you know, I was in, I, I, I didn't say this, but I was in corporate for 10, well, more than 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I'd come from, you know, working jobs like being the manager at a sporting goods store. And I, so I had a little bit of retail experience. And working and, with people also, the customers. Yeah, and I worked in music retail as okay. well, selling instruments and stuff like this. So I had a little bit of retail and a little bit of experience with people in that environment. And then I got in the corporate world uh, it's 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 a very similar again. You're dealing with lots of different contacts and people that you have to meet. I was in sales, so it it was another growing phase of learning how to work with people and and also looking at the bottom line at the same time. And so that kind of carried mm -hmm. over and in, back into music again. And uh, I became a little more focused about doing this as a once I got into it full time. It changed my focus. I've yes. had a few people yeah. who work with me who ended up losing their job. And when they lost their job, their focus about being full-time mm -hmm. totally flipped. Yes. All of a sudden, it's really important to be there on time. It's really important <laughs> to please your crowd. Uh, it just changes your perspective. And it's a little different for people who are just doing it 
um, as more a side thing yeah, right. than it's it is hobby. as a full time. Like, man, if I don't get this gig, you know, you're yeah. trying to balance what your worth is, uh, what your time's worth, and you're trying to balance what everybody else wants, mm -hmm. and you're trying to balance the the artistic side of it that we all want to do certain things. It's a very difficult. I don't know how I've done it. Honestly, it's it's crazy <laughs> when I think about it that way. But I I, I think about it in very small mm -hmm. segmented pieces all the time. That's how I when I'm working on something I'm thinking about pieces, not And then you put all the pieces together. If I think about this, yeah. I'm going to be yeah. totally lost. So so if if you weren't a musician, mm -hmm. what do you think you'd be doing with your life? That's crazy. A scientist? A scientist. Yeah, okay. I, I love right. science. Okay. I love to watch like all the uh, stuff on the science channels and I, I love like this thing with Elon Musk with the new rocket. Oh, I know. I yeah. Mean, I was just so pretty cool stuff. over the moon about this whole idea. So I, you know, I always wanted to be before music. I was always interested in aerospace. So I, it's funny that I ended up in Huntsville. Perfect place. Because I, as a kid, I always wanted to be a pilot or an astronaut, and that didn't work out. But I did end up in a town where that's you know the the income here. So it's always exciting. It is. To be here. It is. And, and, and we're growing. And, and I think there's more opportunities for musicians now as, as the city grows. Oh, also, yeah. Yeah, the city's growing. And, and, yeah. and there is uh, things are starting to expand. And there are more and more places to play. Yeah. So where do you see the music industry going? Uh, you know, I know you also do recording. Mm -hmm. and you record other artists as well as your bands and your artists and yourself. Right. Uh, you've, you've had uh, several CDs. As a matter of fact, I was fortunate to have one of your CDs at mm -hmm. EA Tunes, which I love. So where do you see the music industry going, in your opinion? Uh, it, it's, you know, people say it all the time, it's changing all the time. Um, it's constantly moving. So uh, it, it's cool. There's, you know, with music, I think this is why I'm into music, is that there's so many variations of things that you can get into mm -hmm. about it, whether it's the recording side or uh, production, like being a producer, being actually involved in projects and seeing the fruition I never get bored with it so yeah. there in as far as what things are you know things are growing in all different directions all the time mm -hmm. so I think it's cool I think that you can do so many different things that I don't think it's you know people are a little worried about certain genres maybe rock but I think, it, you know, there's always somebody new coming. you got this Greta Van Fleet band that everybody's excited about. Yeah, they are great. And, you know, yeah. you never know. It you may or may not be fruitful, but at least we've got, you know, something that's saying, yeah, people could dig that again. I mean, sure. And it, it just cycles. So I, I think it's good. I mean, there's some things with the writer's royalties that have been troublesome to, mm -hmm. to them. And they're, I think they're figuring that out and figuring out how to fix that. And there's a lot of other issues that they could fix, and I think we'll figure those out. Um, you know, iTunes was a little shock mm -hmm. to everybody, and I think there's still people like myself and probably you and other people who like physical. Yes. And even though yeah. CD has apparently gone away from Best Buy last week or whatever, uh, vinyl it's is co is it's coming. I mean, back. I was in the store in yeah. LA, and it was yeah, I it was it. so big. The vinyl selection was like, it down. was really like when I used to go to the record stores in the 80s. Yeah. My son Tyler has has vinyl. He thinks it's so cool. So one day I, I saw him and he was carrying the vinyl around like this. And I said, oh, I said, Tyler, you can't get your fingerprints on there. And he says, why? And I said, well, because there are grooves. And so he played one of his albums and it kept going stick stick you know it's like er, er, er. he goes mom what's wrong with my album I'm like it's sticking and he's like what does that mean right. so you know that weird it's new but they're like but he loves he loves the that's vinyl, cool though which is really it's cool, cool. and i've yeah. seen that in, in yeah. some of the stores when i've been in the, the kids there are kids who really like the physical so i think in the future we're going to see more of that i mean if that's yeah i'm, I'm hoping I, I think you know the the, the guitar itself there's there's you know, there are people saying that, you know, who is the next guitar player that will um, push it on push, push it on, and who will inspire new guitar players. Right, right. Uh, and that's a little, that's a little troublesome. I think that, you know, when you're talking about change and, and the future, there's got to be that person. There needs to be, whoever that's going to be. that's going to be. And, and there might be. I mean, there's guys uh, like Tosin Abasi and other guys like in that realm who are coming incredible mm -hmm. in the whole multi you know, seven string, eight string, nine string. 
it's taken that to a whole new place. It's just you got to go look for it. it it's, you know, wasn't yeah. like when we, Steve Vai, everybody knew about Steve Vai at the same time. Yeah. It's it's more segmented, so it's harder to find it. But but we're figuring that out, I think. Well, you have released some pretty amazing CDs. Thank you. What's been some of your favorite songs on them and, and a, I guess, a learning experience that you learned from recording your own music? Oh, that was why I did it. You know, one of the reasons I did the last CD was because I uh, wanted to take my recording skills to another level. Or my mixing skills. Okay. Um, I've been recording since since I got a guitar. Mm-hmm. I had, this is a crazy story, but two boom boxes. I, you know, everybody that, well, not everybody, especially the kids that they wouldn't know. They but wouldn't know what Basically, it is. a boom box is a radio <laughs> that you carry around, and you could record with it. And I had two of them. I think my sister had one, I had one. But what you could do is you could record yourself playing guitar in the one, and you could set that one over here, hit play, and turn the other one on record, and you could record yourself playing to this other track. You're doing your own tracks. <laughs> You're doing multi-track. But I didn't know what multi-track was. I just knew that yeah. I wanted to play lead on top of a rhythm mm-hmm. that I had just learned from my teacher, and that's what I would do. So how I started recording was I just wanted to be able to implement what he was showing me, how to improvise over an E or something. And I would play to the tape and then record it so I could hear it. So that's how it started. Okay. So, you know, you go through the whole you know, thing with, with four-track recorders, little four-tracks, uh, then to reel-to-reel, and then to digital audio workstations, and now, you know, crazy, but... Um, what was the question? But again? recording your own music. Oh. All right, you you put together a whole CD, which means you wrote all of the music. Yeah, and, and I did all the recording. And you played it, and you recorded it. And I had drummers on it. I had, got it I, out on CDs. I had friends of mine come over here, and we recorded, uh, well, we recorded the drums in Birmingham, mm-hmm. but but primarily I played all their instruments on it. Um, and then I had the drums recorded in Birmingham professionally, but I mixed them. So one of the things I wanted to learn was how... To, how, all that how to mix real drums. Okay. Because I could use samples, I guess, but part of me just wanted to know how that was really done back in the old days and how I could get to at least... I thought, well, I'll do that first and then I can use whatever I want after I know how to do mm-hmm. it. You know, so it's all building. So recording... Okay. What about the writing of, of your music? How, how, how do you get inspiration from, from the music that you write? Well, usually it's just... It's funny because... It's either just sitting around playing, mm-hmm. noodling is my favorite hero says, noodling, or it's you know, I could be, I could be working on one thing, and then something else just pops out, and then I just go with that. Go with that one. Um, yeah, it's it. Writing music is, I, I've never been able to do it structured that well. Like a lot of people go to writing sessions, and yeah. or they'll get in a room and jam, and sometimes that works, uh, but most of my stuff. It was like stuff I recognize as unique to myself. So do you just do you just hear something and you go, I got to get this down? Yeah, usually okay. it's just an idea that pops out. Like I have my what we call stock licks. You would know about that as a guitar player. You have, yeah, that's right, you have yeah. your stock licks. It's like as a vocalist, you would sing right. this most of the time to get, if you're improvising, say. Um, so we have those on guitar. So... I might be doing that, and then something non-stock, something that I've way. never played, yeah. pops out mm-hmm. by accident or mm-hmm. or just by luck, and then I take that single idea, record it, and then I build on you that. Build idea. on it, and that's pretty much what the CD that I gave you has, all mm-hmm. instrumental, something I never plan on doing, but um, it's all unique ideas that I. Went, oh. Yeah, and, and I loved it. It was great, great guitar playing. Thanks. On that. Okay, speaking of guitars, if you were stranded on an island, and you could take only one guitar with you. Oh, wow. What guitar would that be? <laughs> Not, I mean, for a guitar player, it's a tough for, question. For me, yeah, I mean, jeez. Well, it's kind of like saying, which kid would you take with you? <laughs> yeah, I'd probably take my flying, the Flying V, because the Flying V, uh, I got a Flying V, an 83 Flying V, um, maybe 10 years ago. And um, it's sort of like the thing. I mean, okay. guitar players just love the Flying V. I mean, a lot of people like Les Pauls, but the Flying V is that unique it's guitar. A, it's got that rock look. It's just the rock yeah, thing, right? It it's is. it's such a cool-looking guitar. And this one just sounds incredible. And uh, I think it just would always remind me of, you know, 
rock and roll and my, my inspiration <laughs> to be in the business. It's just such a iconic visual to go along with uh, something like these big monsters. So with all the things that you have going on mm-hmm. and, and all the success that you've had, let me ask you this question. Yeah. How lucky are you? I'm really lucky. Yeah. You know, the, I think that it's, you know, when you first start out, you, you dream of being your hero mm-hmm. and being in his world. Being a being a rock star, yeah. you know that's what I, that's right. as a as a naive kid, <laughs> yeah. that's what I thought I wanted to be. Uh, but when you get older, and you actually are in that world, whether you're actually on the road, but you maybe you know people in the world, or you've been in that world enough to know, you realize that it's not what you think it might be. It's a lot harder than you think it might be. Um, it's a lot more business oriented than you think it might yeah. be. There's so many things that you realize that maybe they don't work for you personally, like traveling. I mean, you got to be able to travel, and you got to be able to travel well with other people, <laughs> and you got to be able to sleep, which I think is a big thing that people have trouble with on the road. Yeah, sleeping yeah. is very important. Yeah, and I always had trouble with sleeping. So, I mean, you know, not everybody's cut out for that life. Um, I don't know if I was or wasn't. I didn't really travel extensively at any time for weeks and weeks or anything. But, um, yeah, I think that with uh, the road or whatever or, or that that ideal, it's not always what you think. So being lucky, I'm lucky I can do this in my hometown and survive, which, you know, is it, my buddy told me a few weeks ago, do you know how lucky you are? I'm like, yeah, I, I do know how lucky and how hard that is. I, and I just know there's only like a few people in town that are doing it, and I'm one of them. And, you know, I have my wife who we split everything and that that obviously is a big part of that but uh i do feel like you know i bring home my part of the living every month and i it's just like any other job really (laughs) except i'm lucky because i get to do exactly what i love to do and when i started doing that 10 years ago it was just like wow i can't believe i'm finally doing something that I get up every day and I go, oh, good, I get to go to work today. <laughs> well, when, when I ask people how lucky do they think they are, when they say they feel very lucky, that means they've worked hard, they've earned it, they've gotten to where they yeah. are considered successful because luck is, you know, the, the, the harder you work, the more successful you are, the True. lucky you are. True. So you've been very successful, and that's why. Very. Uh, it's, 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 and it is all that. It's all the work and all the time. And, and you do feel very rewarded by the, by the fact that you did – earn it that's it's, true it's, you, it's a definitely. lot of work so you bring up darla i want to yeah. ask you about darla yeah um amazing woman amazing mm-hmm. wife yeah. uh she supports you in all the business and let's face it in the music world that's one thing that a musician hat a musician has to have and that is the support of their spouse yeah and, and so every tell success- me about uh, yeah, every the angel success- that she is well every successful musician i think that, that i know has has somebody at home that's really supportive I mean, at all levels, every person that I've interviewed. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It's just amazing when you go through those interviews. Yeah. You can find that most of those people have that person at home who supports it. It's very difficult to find. And, and I'm super lucky mm-hmm. to, to have found that. It's so hard. How long have you guys been married? I've been married 18 years 18 this years. year. Um, yeah, and when we met, we met. When I was playing, so it, you know, she knew what she was getting into. Did she see you on stage and say, "I must have that"? No. Or, or did you see her and go, no. "I must have that"? Woman. It was. It was more like <laughs> I was playing a place that she shouldn't have been because it was like an old. It was an Eagles. Eagles. What, what do you call them? Uh, one of the lodges. Lodges, okay, right? And all right. It was for like senior citizens, mm-hmm. you know, to hang out there. And her parents were hanging out there, and she went with her parents. So there were very few young people there. Okay. <laughs> at, my, at that time, I was 30 or whatever, 30, 30 31. And uh, so they were all double our age. So, it, you know, it was kind of like, oh, there's a cute girl, and she's actually something near my age, you know. So anyway, <laughs> and uh, but no, it was she wanted to play the drums is what she wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't hang out with the drummer, but he was way, oh, okay. but he was way older. So, <laughs> ah, drummers, it's guitar players that you want. <laughs> we figured it. She figured it out. She got that straight. So yeah, oh, it's you know, it's good. been a great road, and we we've always been a team. So that's a huge thing, and and she, you know, some people will never adapt to your life, and they try to 
fit into it, mm-hmm. and and other people just naturally fall into what you're interested in. I mean, it seems selfish in a way that she has to be interested in. But she was already interested in music. She mm-hmm. like yeah. loved music before me, so it was a little bit of a natural thing for her to to get interested in going to NAMM shows and all that. I saw her go to the NAMM show with you this yeah. past time. And she's gone, yeah. you know, multiple times. Yeah, but but it's been a few years. And so she went this time and, and really enjoyed herself. It's been a while. Mm-hmm. So she she got really excited to meet Alice Cooper, which we got to finally both meet him. And, and you know, we have our friend who used to play for him. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of cool to be able to talk to him about that a little bit. And, and he was so nice. I mean, you know, when you, you never know, you know, yes, yeah. and when you meet one of these people and, you know, like people were always warning me about Eddie Van Halen, right? When I, when I was going to meet Eddie Van Halen like three years ago today, they don't meet your heroes. I've heard that. You know, I've don't meet your you heroes because be you could be disappointed. Yeah, and, right. and, you know, in his life and time, I think it all worked out for me perfectly because when I met him, he was at exactly the right moment to be able to, to do that. Yeah. And, and it worked out fine. Every time that somebody had that happen to them in the past, it probably wasn't a good time. (laughs) (laughs) But with Alice Cooper, it was the same thing. It felt like, wow, you know, you always imagine they're going to be, it's going to feel natural. Mm -hmm. And it was totally like that. That's great. So, yeah, it was great. Maybe he's mellowed out also. Yeah, you know, I think he's a great, I really think he's, you know, I've heard he's a great guy, but just having a moment with him, I was like, wow. This guy and, and, and you got that. to you got to meet. I mean, who is your most favorite guitar player? Well, of course, Eddie Van Halen. Eddie Van Halen. So you, and you got to meet with him and hang out with him. Yeah, and about so, three years well, ago, actually, he got yeah. to hang out with you. So that's well, it was cool. the Smithsonian when he was at the Smithsonian to have his guitars put in, and uh, they did a special thing called. Um, it was about immigrants coming to America and having success stories. I saw that. and I love that interview. Yeah, he he really uh, epitomized the the you know the immigrants that come here that that. Make America their home. Sure. And and are proud Americans. Sure. And it was his stories of the classic story. You know, they didn't have anything when they came. One of the things he, I, I don't know that he said it in that interview, but, you know, I went to his home, his childhood home, last two, two weeks ago when I was in L.A. And it's always amazing because it's such a small little house, yeah. maybe 900 square feet. But the, the truth was he lived in a, like, in a smaller place with other families at first when he came to the U.S. So at first he was like sharing a home or yeah. apartment with other people from Amsterdam. So, you know, he literally came over the boat, got a really small apartment, <laughs> and then they eventually, or his dad was a musician, so eventually between his regular jobs and playing, he was able to get the home and all that. So when I go there, I always think about how hard that was yeah. for them to come to, you know, Los Angeles, and then for what to happen, happened to them. Hard hard work? Yeah, and you know, the thing I said in the video that I posted about that, we called it the Van Halen Trail, was that he never left that home until about the fourth or fifth, between the fourth, the fourth Van Halen album came out, a Fair Warning. He moved straight from the small home up into the Hollywood Hills. Literally never had anything in between. Mm. Just that amazing story about how you can come to the United States with nothing. With nothing. With nothing. And with with the, with, with, the, with the drive. That's true. They had the drive. And he, he said that in, in that um, you know, in that talk in, in DC that the reason that Van Halen made it and anybody else could make it was because they busted their tail. They went out and took it to the people, they sold it, and they worked it and worked it and worked it for a decade, you know, almost. It's all about it's all about that. That's true. Yeah. That's true. It is. So if you could choose one song to play the rest of your life, oh what God. song would that be? You really got me. <laughs> you really got me. <laughs> Not because it's Van Halen. It's it's a, the classic rock riff. I, I think a lot of people think that was the, and it said that it was the first song that Distortion was actually kind of on because he cut the speaker with a. Oh, razor right. blade yeah, and yeah. and it made a cool sound and it was distortion and and uh, I remember when I was a kid that that sound was what what we wanted that's what we heard on those records that's and, right. that's and it right. really came from Ray Davies back in the Kinks mm-hmm. playing You Really Got Me not Eddie Van Halen but but when Van Halen did You Really Got Me it was like they turned it to the next level and it's never been <laughs> it's always been different <laughs> since I mean Everything's evolved since that point. How many Van Halen concerts have you been to? Uh, 
probably 15. 15. Maybe, I don't All know right. exactly. Okay. So what's, what's the strangest gig you've ever played? Oh, God. It's a bunch of those. <laughs> <laughs> you can't narrow it down to one. Oh, God. Well, if I think, I mean, there's this one place I used to play for, I played it for a decade. It was called the American Legion Hall. It was in Bessemer, Alabama, which is, it's kind of the blue collar section of, of Birmingham, um, where the steel mills are very close, Fairfield, that whole area. Um, and it, we started at 11 at first, and then we moved to 12, and we'd end at 5. So it was a total late night dump out for anybody who wow. uh, either was <laughs> too too messed up to go home yet or was getting off work, you know, and that was kind of what you had there. And the stuff I, I saw there over 10 <laughs> years is... Probably not speakable, right? A lot of it, no. Yeah, okay. But, but it, you know, it was it was literally like the, the proving grounds for me. It was the place where I, you know, I have to give like my band that was called 911 and there was one called Wolf Creek at that point that were, that were after my... 80s bands, 90s bands. That there was one called Relics too that was in between there and Panda Bang Wangas, which I've got back together again. I, yeah, I've heard of them. But the uh, that band in between was where I cut my teeth on all this different material, where I built my repertoire. So every band, every player has to pay you dues, right? That's where it was, <laughs> and I, you know I felt I think like like a lot of people, like the younger people I bring into my bands, they sort of have to do this too. It's not like I'm not making them. This is just part of the process. Yes. It's not, you know, and, and learning about your craft and learning about what people are attracted to musically, it's just part of it. It's what I did. I had to do it too. I spent 10 years in this place mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it wouldn't be considered nice, you know, compared to some of the places that we play. Um but it didn't matter. I was learning. Right. It's about it's about playing. It's about getting out there. And, and, and playing. Like I said, every every band member has to pay you dues because no one starts at the top of the never gigs. never. You always start out terrible. That's right. You always. I mean, I. You know, people say like, I mean, Eddie Van Halen had the guitar came pretty easy to him. Mm -hmm. It does to to some people, but there's still a mechanical thing that has to happen. It's going to take even Eddie Van Halen a little bit of time. Right, yeah. Even though he had classical piano under his fingers, he still had to, you know, he spent some time getting there. It wasn't like it happened overnight. If you listen to the, the bootlegs, you can hear that he wasn't the developed player mm -hmm. in 75 or 76 that you heard in 78. Yeah. He made a huge leap in there. But that's from playing. That's gigging. That's, you know, they say it. They gigged all the time. They gigged, you know, four or five nights a week. Yeah. And, and super long four or five hours of sets they had did four sets not three like we do um so yeah they learned on the job so how many gigs do you play a week three to four three depending to four. on what yeah. you know what i want to do mm -hmm. i mean uh, one of the things that i, I ran across <laughs> probably over the last few years was that i needed to, to make sure that i balanced how much i worked mm -hmm. I mean, you know, everybody knows the balance in their life, but well, any any business person, it's it's a twenty four hour thing. Right, you're you're constantly yeah. working it. Yeah, you're working it even if you're not working exactly physically. Yeah, but I, I I did realize I needed to take some time here and there just to have a day or two to do something else. Yeah, uh, my mom used to always be like, "You just do this. This is too much." You, play all the time uh, because you, your mom all you that. think about my mom said you work so hard you need, you need to get some yeah. other hobbies and i'm like mom this is this is my hobby yeah. uh, so. so what hobbies do you have besides music then <laughs> not many probably none not many no i you know i play golf with my dad sometimes are um, you a good golfer i'm not too bad yeah. we started really young okay. so he had me out there when i was a little bitty kid so that helped that was almost like, you know, I think when you think of some great player like Tiger Woods mm -hmm. or some great guitarist like Eddie Van Halen, it starts because they started really, really young. Yeah. And it seems natural because they, in that period, you oh, just, oh, they're just taking it in. It soaks just in. soaks in so That's easily. True. So when That's golf true. was introduced to me as a little kid with little cutoff sticks, mm -hmm. it, it now feels like just getting back on the horse when I go back okay. out and not great at it and you know I'm not my short game sucks but but it feels pretty natural even though it's not it was large so what would be something that tell me something that that you got from your mom and mm -hmm. something that you got from your dad well uh, my mother 
Well, my dad I got the business thing from. Okay. He's, he's very bottom line oriented. And um, he looks at everything as a business. Sometimes I have to go back to him and say, hey, I, I get it. I understand <laughs> that, you know, we were worried about the, the finances, and I get that. And I worry about them. But music is also art, and it's not all about the finances. There's a balance there. So I can, we, we, we usually get to yeah, where we need to get to with that. lessons learned. We'll get there. But mom is more uh, emotional. Okay. She's more uh, sensitive. She used to say, you're always, you're just sensitive like me. That's why, <laughs> you know, it's hard for you to do certain things and crowds. and Because mm-hmm. I used to be really shy when I was young. So I, as I grew up, I realized if you want to be in the entertainment business, you have to kind of let the shyness go and, yeah. and, and get on with that. And it's sort of like this program. When I first started filming these things, I was really nervous about it. And then you have to become where you, it's like second nature by doing it, mm-hmm. adjusting and over time, I became, people wouldn't think I was introverted, you know, at all, but I, I, I was. I was like the kid that wouldn't speak, you know. <laughs> Does he talk? And is he, you know, what's he doing now? Because he's always asleep in class. Well, that's, that, that's great. That's great that you, you, you have those two balance and things between yeah. your mom and your Yeah, and, and they that's both really have these, these great qualities that I, that I was able to get, you know, from them that uh, I'm eternally grateful for. Because really... The way you're brought up is is most of it, you know. Mm-hmm. And and the other thing that Joe Satriani says, which <laughs> always plays to me, is that ninety percent of success is showing up. <laughs> because you, I've you, known people that just didn't show up. It's right. like yeah, most of yes. the time, if you just do a good job and show up uh, and do the job you're supposed to do, it's not that hard. Mm-hmm. But you'd be surprised how many art, artists have trouble with those things, um, and. It's part of the brain thing. I don't know. We were talking about that earlier about artist brains, you know, mm-hmm. how we are a little, you know, we can focus really hard, but then we can't necessarily focus very well and we're not doing that. And it squirrel gets scattered. Squirrel comes along and, and that's and, it. Oh, squirrel. Right, exactly. And that, that yeah. seems to be a regular thing in the music business and, and, and very intense with the super, mm-hmm. super talented people like Eddie Van Halen. You hear that all the time about him, that, that he's a genius but there's a lot of issues with that, you know, that go around it that, that were probably out of balance as mm-hmm. far as, you know, like we're talking about balance, having balance. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you like to to leave in this world as a legacy of what Jeff is about? Well, I just want people to know they could do what they want to do. You know? Because That's I, awesome. I was I was scared to death like everybody else. But, you know, when you're fourteen and you go, I wanna be a rock star, I mean like that's like what? <laughs> sure. You, yeah, that's going to be really hard to do. Yeah. And uh, and my parents were scared for me. You know, they were like, oh, and I wanted to go to L.A. and I wanted to do all this crazy stuff, and they were really scared for me. But but I kept on my path. I found my way to it. And, and when, you know, that happened, and that was through a bunch of different things happening. And I basically had to build my career uh, back back to being a full-time musician by... Just a, few, a bunch of different circumstances were bands. I ended up with enough bands. Because I, I, mean, I started with one band. And then I added another band. And then I added another band. And by, before I knew it, I had enough income coming in that I realized, oh, I could maybe do this full time. And that's when I made the jump to jump full time. So part of it was circumstance that allowed me to do it. Part of it was having a partner who supported me. Uh, not totally supported me. Just supported my will to do it and knew I'd be happy doing it and then getting out and doing it and being happy when you're happy Mm -hmm. and you're doing what you love it's like they say you never work a day in your life that's true and it doesn't feel like work I mean yeah it feels like working and carrying a big cabinet but (laughs) but you know what I mean when you get you get up you want to go to work that's what you need to know whatever that is Mm -hmm. uh, you got to find that to me I mean you guys have done that I'm sure um, I think anybody that's really successful or anything has found that thing. Yeah, and and again, it's 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 paying your dues. Everybody who wants to to find your thing, you're always going to have to start with paying your dues, and then you you'll know, get your thing. And and then you'll get your thing. Sure, you, know, you will. If you work, stick with it, you got to stick with it, and you got to show up. <laughs> show like up and say. stick with it. I mean, you that's a really simple up. business principles, but they're they're the, some of the most important. Yeah, and and it makes it worth it. So speaking of making it worth it. What's the best gig that you've ever played? God. That you'd say, man, I would do that 
all over. There are so many good ones. You know what? There there are gigs every every so often, not every weekend, but like we had one Saturday night. Mm-hmm. They're just you walk in and everything comes together. The people just go bonkers and mm-hmm. and the songs are the right songs and, and it just works. Yeah. And and uh, there's so many. Um, but there are not so many that it, it bores you, <laughs> that you get used to it. The night before wasn't so good. Okay. And the, and the thing about it was, it was with, with Plan B, and the weekend before, we had an awesome gig. Mm-hmm. And I turned to Kelly, our singer, who's you know fairly young, younger, and I said, this is the kind of gig that makes you appreciate last weekend's gig. Because if you had this yeah. that last weekend every weekend, what were, where would be the win, right? Yeah, that's true. If it was, if everything was given to you on a silver platter, where's the, where's the accomplishment? Mm-hmm. And so, every big gig, I'm just like, oh, wow, that was good. And I feel like going back home and getting ready for the next one, you know. Yeah. So it's my juice. That's that's cool. And there's cool. so many gigs that are so great. They're just, I mean, there's obviously ones I can think of way back, back in the day, and when I was younger, there was some really just awesome things we wanted. We won a contest one time to open for the Romantics, which was really wow. cool. So that was, wow. and we won money, and we got to be on the radio, and you know, and we were on the radio and TV and a bunch of other stuff back in the day. So there were things like that around that were that were cool. Your parents got to see you, and all your friends and family got to be on TV. <laughs> I'm and, so proud of you, right? And all that. <laughs> so those are cool, but you know, getting the getting open for that band was cool because they were, you know. We played their song at the time. We played what I like about you. At that moment, we were playing in that band. So we had to take it out of the set list and get beat up. So what, what, would you, what advice would you give to a musician who wants to get into a band? Well, if you, if you, you, know, you mean somebody who's brand new to music or somebody who's been playing? Somebody who's been... You know, in in their back bedroom with their amps, okay. their guitars, and they've just been playing the riffs, and they've been getting their chops down, and they're right. like, "Okay, I really want to play with somebody else. I really want to play with somebody else." Yeah. What would be your advice there? Well, it, it depends on your age. I mean, obviously, like I did, I I managed to talk my other friends into it. <laughs> so, so if you can't join a band, make, make one, make one, <laughs> make one out of your friends. That's the one. Talk them into okay. it. Okay. So go get him a guitar and say, here, I'll show you how to do this. I'll play along with it. Because that's what we did. I mean, I literally would show my buddy okay. how to play bass. And I said, you play the bass. And then he turned out to be a pretty good bass player and still plays guitar to this day. Um, but, yeah, that would be first. And then if you're, say, 20-ish, you know, you got college and mm-hmm. high school and, and you know, friends in high school first and then college, you know, you try to find find those bands. You can go to music stores. That's, I'd say, Music stores. Don't hang out in music okay. stores. You'll meet other musicians there. I worked at a music store. I did too. So in college, when, I worked at a music store. So when I worked yeah. at a music store, I met people all the time. They'd yeah. come in and play, and I'd go, wow, well, he's pretty good. Yeah. You know, play bass for us, and that's how one of our bass players came about. Um, going, to sh- going to shows, meeting other people at shows. Okay. You know, you go to go out and see other bands, and you see somebody, start talking to somebody, you know. You never know. I mean, it literally happened to me with the Panda Bang Wang, because... This guy and I ran into each other, seeing my friend Damon way back, and he, he said, I said, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm trying to find a band. I'm like, I'm trying to find a singer. And literally, boom, done. It happened. And we put it together, and we're still playing together today, 30 some odd years later. Mm-hmm. You just, you got to, you know, when I moved here, this is a good story. My wife was really, it was really important in this success of anything that happened in Huntsville and I'll tell you why because I lived in Birmingham everything I had done and everything I had built up was in Birmingham okay when I came to Huntsville I didn't know a single I knew of Dave Anderson but I didn't know him at all um that's the only person I knew and so I'm like I really want to play in a band again and she's like well you really got to get out and see somebody and meet some people if you want to be in a band again yeah, go out and play with the other kids. <laughs> right, exactly. And so I did that. And I found a drummer and singer pretty quickly. And that became the first version of Crush. Well, let me ask you this. See, these days, you know, Craigslist and band mix and, of course, going to see the bands is the way a lot of band members find them. How did, now, how did you 
find your drummer? Was that going out to the shows? Yeah, yeah, he was playing for another okay. band. All right, okay. And I asked him, I said, do you know any other drummers? Okay. Because, obviously, he's a drummer, he would know drummers. And uh, he goes, I'm interested. And I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't know, you, you know if you'd, you'd be interested. So that's where that started. And I had a bass player that I played acoustic with. We did a duo for a while, mm -hmm. and we didn't have anything else. But we had our harmonies down. We had worked our harmonies out. We had a lot of songs together by that point, a couple of years of that. And then we just added him in, and I went and switched to electric, and he switched to bass, and done. Okay. So yeah. Crush was born out of a three-piece okay. so about acoustic the, project. You just have to get out there and meet people. Being, so, being in bands and playing music, it's all about Just talk about it, too, because the funny thing about the bass player is that his wife was our gym instructor. And it was just saying that I was a musician or whatever that said, hey, I, well, my husband plays bass. And I'm like, what? He's a singer, too. He's like, and it was just a small conversation that, that created that opportunity to meet him and then created Crush. It was literally out of some very, you know, just literally barely making any effort at all, just putting it out there that you wanted to. And the 10 years went by. Boom. That's great. That's great. Well, you've had an amazing, amazing career, and it continues to grow with all yeah, of the bands that you yeah. have. And and uh, and just watching you, I know you have helped develop many musicians here. Yeah, I got into that. That's weird. I, yeah. I, I started to started to mentor some, which has been interesting. I really had some pretty cool things happen with that. I put a kid out and uh, helped a kid get to GIT, where I never went. He's out That's there great. loving it, yeah. living it, and, and it's awesome. And I've had other... Mothers uh, of, that had children that knew me mm -hmm. from playing. So, what's the one thing mm -hmm. that you would like musicians to remember about about whether it's playing, whether it's trying to be a rock star, whether it's you know what's what's the one thing that you have felt inside of you that you always try to remember when you are either playing or you're creating. Um, or when you're mentoring, you know, what's, what's, what's that thing that, that's in here that keeps you going as a musician? Well, I mean, for me, that, they're all those things that you're talking about, I mean, you know, the mentoring has been, has been new for me. And, and it's been exciting in a way because, you know, it's great to be able to give back. Uh, something that you, sometimes I think it's just you get older and you, you realize that it, it's important. Absolutely and, important. Yeah, yes. and, and it's yeah. something that, that as you get older, you, you realize you have enough experience to, to, to share, you know. And like with the younger people that are involved in my bands, you know, I'm always trying to share the experience. You know, when you're young, I was younger, we were all younger, and, you know, I had older guys that were teaching me mm -hmm. things. And I was also learning things about what they were doing that was not working either. So I would watch what they do, and then I'd, you know, I'd always try to figure out what was working. Um, so musicians always got to know their crowd. I think that's, you know, if you come to okay. me. Know your crowd. You come to me, that's the first thing I'm going to say to you is that, you know, as a cover artist in a band, I mean, I'm an artist that I do my own music, but I also play as a, in a cover band. Mm -hmm. So in my cover world, I'm always worried about the customer. Um, I'm worried about making sure that I touch as many people in that room as possible, making sure that I can touch as many people as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, in our, in our world, it's, you know, you get 500 people. That's a big deal, you know, that's, or 1,000 people yeah. locally. You know, you might do, like, concerts in the park or whatever. That's, that's hundreds of people, thousands maybe. Thousands. And that's a lot of people, I and mean, that's great. And you want to touch as many of those people as you can with your music. Um, for me, that's how it is. Now, there are artists who prefer, you know, to do what they do, and if that makes people happy, fine. But normally with their own music. Yeah. Um, and, and then covers is another thing where you've got capability. You know, do you have all the people can do that? That kind of thing. But you, you got to please your, please your public, and they're not, they are not you. They don't. They don't even own albums, maybe. <laughs> they may not. I mean, yeah. I, I always, I don't know when this started for me, but there was a point when it became clear to me, maybe it was when I got going up here in Huntsville, um, that people in this area, their average people do not necessarily own music. 
like we do because we, we love music. We buy right. music. We consume That's music. true. Every we, day. It's a, it's we a part. live it. Yeah. And all of our friends do. That's right. And all the musicians in town do. And I get it. I love that. I mean, I'm one of the, those people. Mm-hmm. But I, there was some point where I realized, oh, but they don't. <laughs> and I'm trying to touch them. And... I'm not doing it because I'm trying to please me first. And I'm not saying you can't please yourself some that mm-hmm. in that way, but you, there's a balance. And you have to figure out how to do that. So when I bring the young people in, I'm always like trying to tell them because they'll throw an idea at me and I'm like, mm, probably not going to work. I feel like the dad, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. you know, knowing everything, right? I don't know everything. Well, you've, you've lived it. I, I don't know I, everything. That makes a difference. But, but the thing is, after you've done... 5,000 gigs and you've played, or yeah, 5,000 gigs for 30 years Mm -hmm. and you've played practically every song you can think of that's been popular, you kind of see which ones work and which ones don't. Yeah. And you learn what people respond to. And it becomes really easy for you to pick songs. And you just want to make it easy for them, Mm -hmm. which is, that's all I'm saying is like... We could do that, but if we do that, you know, we we might lose some people. Do we want to lose people? I mean, I... It's a balance, yeah. I did it this weekend, Lisa. I mean, I, I, I pulled the cardinal sin on myself. <laughs> did you play something that I played, Jeff wanted to I play? I played three songs Jeff wanted to play, <laughs> back and to back. And it was for Jeff only. And I should, have been, I should have been kicked, because <laughs> by the time the set was over... <laughs> The, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the night was over, <laughs> and it was only three songs. Yeah, but when we put them at the end of the set, mm-hmm. on I did it on purpose yeah. to put. I knew it would have maybe contribute to that. It may not have been totally the songs; could have been people retired and. Yeah. But the set up to that point had killed, <laughs> killed, whole way. That's a, that's a that's a great lesson learned that you can only get from a mentor. You know, you are absolutely right. And that's something I've not thought of. In in the business world, you know, I always tell people get a mentor so that you don't have to spend and waste your time making the same mistakes that yeah. they've already done. Yeah. And you can succeed a lot quicker. Yeah. And um, you know, I haven't really always put that toward the music world. But the one thing that I remember before I even met you, I sent you some Facebook messages uh-huh. asking you some advice on some things because you were posting that you were using these these type of uh, sound gear and I was curious and I asked you and then I asked you other questions and I remember how gracious you were and how nice you were to really... Oh, I, you know, I mean, hey, he doesn't mentor just to young people. He mentors to old people well, too. I mean, okay, anybody can so. send me a question. I mean, I'm always open to anybody, so. to, to anybody asking me anything about music because I love to talk about that. And, and it's something that I that I have sat there and done all my life and it's great to be able to help you or anybody yeah, you know get get an easier way because I've already done that work for you I mean why not I mean if I can show you or help you mm-hmm. I think it's great I always want to foster the music in our area or anybody who wants to do it see there you go everybody everybody out there this man is ready to mentor and help yeah, send me a message. On his spare time, which is like... I'll answer it. You know, <laughs> 2 a.m. in the morning. Well, that's probably. when I answer it. <laughs> I answer it at night when I watch it on YouTube. Learning more stuff about music stuff. I'm, I'm just addicted to it. I've been addicted to the music. I mean, look at the stuff. People always wonder why I have this. I, I, I have been collecting gear since I was 14 years old. Mm-hmm. And so the reason I have a lot of gear is because if you hoard anything <laughs> year after year after year for 40 years... It's going to be piled to the ceiling by the time you get to 40 years. And it's just, I love it. And every guitar feels it different. And it, it does. makes you feel a certain way. Every guitar has a song in it. That's My a different wife song. always, you know, I've been trying to tell her this for years. It's, <laughs> because it's always like, you don't need another guitar. No! You know, constantly. And, but I, I explained to her, like, when I pick up a guitar... Or anything could be any instrument, really, piano, keyboard. When I pick it up, there's always a flash of inspiration in there somewhere. Somewhere. And yeah. that guitar could be that guitar that writes that greatest song I ever wrote, or, or it could yep, be you something. know just something I really enjoy being with all the time. <laughs> it could be the guitar that I always use. You know, my little my red Wolfgang. They 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 become 
part of you. That's true. You know, there's, I guess there's one other thing that I'd say too, and that's um, about what musician, what did you ask me, what I would tell musicians? Well, what would you tell a musician? Well, there, there's, you know, obviously the 90, you know, showing up is 90% of it. Um, but there's also, like you were saying, the whole thing about preparation, mm-hmm. paying your dues. And this is, comes from Steve Vai, and I think you probably got it somewhere else too. But when you know your material without an iPad, without notes, you can become the music. I mean, you can. That's deep. You become can become the music. Well, that's Steve Vai. He's deep. He's deep. Yeah. But, but the point is, once you can let go of, of the technical mm-hmm. and the stuff that's all in here yeah. that you think about all the time, you can now transmit. It just comes through. And transmit hands. to the people mm-hmm. the message in a more pure, emotional, connective way. You know, he said that about his gigs. I asked him, why am I, how, how come, why are you doing 300 gigs a year? You're, you know, you're almost 60. How, how can you do that? And I said, why are you doing that? Because you don't have to do that. He says, because I'm practicing get, connecting better with people. That was more or less the message he was trying to tell me. I'm trying to live more in the moment, trying to, to, to let go more, let go of the, the things that, that bog you down mentally from being able to... Mm-hmm. To become the music. Um, that's my new thing. Become the music. That's my newest become thing. The music. Become I really, the music. That's, that's awesome. I really like that. Become because, the music. Because in that is that, that pure joy that you get. Yeah. And they get in that moment. When, you, when it's no ego, it's about you delivering a message and giving it to the people. I do the Star Spangled Banner. And I always kind of felt funny about doing it. And because it's such an iconic thing. One, two, you don't want to mess it up That's at true. all. Yeah, because so, if pe- people know that song, they know they know it inside and out. Everybody knows that. <laughs> That's right. Average Joe knows that one too, and they know every single yeah. part of it, and they sing along to it. Um, but I also didn't want it to come off in an egotistical way. You know, like I'm trying to, I don't know, I just didn't want to feel cheap about it. Yeah. I wanted it to be real. And I go into my little world in that, and I focus on the music. I become that music. Because in that moment, I don't want it to be about anything but that music mm-hmm. and those people. Me, me, I'm just the vehicle. That's how I see it. And that's what becoming the music is. I mean, yeah, you got the faces and the people in the bands, and that's important, the image. But what's important is how you connect to those people. That's what they remember when they go home. That's true. Did you hit, did you hit them yeah. here? Did you get them here? Did you hit them here? Yeah. And I, we, I, we, play, we play this Whitney Houston song. Everybody knows I'll, I'll, I'll Always Love You. And, uh, you know, it's sort of like, yeah, it's a little sentimental, right, for a bar. But when you look out there and see people's faces, and, you know, our girl is, is delivering this in a way that it's a, affecting them, just like the Star Spangled Banner does mm-hmm. to people, that is what I live for. That juice, you know. When you see that, you go, wow. When I was a kid, I never thought that I would be able to stand on the stage with an instrument and be able to do that to people and give them that gift, you know? Because it's, it was a gift for me. Mm-hmm. And you and everybody we know. Yeah. It's like such a gift. It is. And to be able to take that and... And share it with, with Share others. it with other people, whether, you know, yeah. whether you're doing originals or whether you're doing covers. It doesn't matter what you do. It matters how you deliver it, how you, you know... And people get caught up in their the things, you know? And if you can unconnect from your things and just be the messenger, man, it's it's the best ever. That's why I love music. This is this this is why this is why Jeff is so amazing. He is who he is, and and he's he's a great musician. Like I said, he's a great friend, and I love the become the music part because that's what it's all about. I think we'll get that tattooed on me. I think you should. I think you should have a t-shirt that way that too. Yeah, but become good. the music, that's going to be... Become the music. That's, I'm going to remember that motto and... Uh, Strive to become the music. If you can become the music then you're then you're doing your job. You're doing, yeah. And, and you're sharing music with other... And that's something that music just crosses all borders. Yeah. I it mean, really does. You're, like, you know, you're... Like, you think of your family. Yeah, they have some connection to it. But when they go see a show, a movie... When they have the soundtrack, I was always in the soundtracks as a kid. How powerful the music is to Star Wars, say, you know? 
and how that through time can still get you. you know, I'll mm-hmm. tell you this story about a soundtrack. E.T. I saw this this documentary called Sound. I think it's called Soundtrack. Anyway, uh, it's called The Score. The Score. It's a documentary called The Score. And in it, they're talking about E.T. soundtrack with uh, John Williams, who, when I was a kid, that's the stuff we heard. I mean, mm-hmm. before Van Halen, right. there was Star Wars, right. right? Right before, right? So I got like, wow, that is awesome. And so I was watching The Score, this new documentary on music, and they showed the one scene at the end of E.T. where E.T. is getting on the rocket ship, and, you I know, remember you remember it, right? <laughs> but when you hear the music with oh, it, yes. instantly make you tear up. That's how powerful that is. Mm-hmm. How powerful music is. It can just, 40 years later, for just one minute, a scene yeah. with that music, just pow. I mean, wow. Yeah. It's just there you so go. powerful. There you go. So we are also fortunate to have that that music in us yeah. to share the music and uh, I think I'm going to strive harder to become the music and thank you Jeff awesome. um, what a what a joy it is to, to be with you thank you for having me today having to me today on my show <laughs> <laughs> it's okay I, I'm glad to do it she taught me into this but but I was you know people it, it was Scott O'Haney my buddy was also wanting me to do it so yeah yeah glad glad we could get the man who's behind the camera in front of the camera and talking about all the music stuff that he knows. Thank you. Thank y'all. Episode 16. (laughs) Me. 17, 18 coming up. Subscribe. Sweet 16. Yes. (laughs) You're the one for that. You're an audience for that.